Okay, we're now recording. Okay, that's good. So we got that going. And we can talk late afterwards about uh, the... Uh... Oh, actually, I think I remember how to get the MP4 file out of here. And then we'll get this get this posted. Okay. Okay. So folks, uh, I'm going to share my screen now and just give you like a background slide of giving you some, uh, you know, the order or the, some kind of outline of our orientation this evening. I thank all you who are able to attend. Um, my name is uh, James Vorbach. I am the director of the Li Library and Information Science uh, Pro uh, Department and, and, and the uh, and I manage the accreditation of the uh, Master of Science in Library and Information Science. Uh, the, let's see, I'm just trying to get to share screen right now. Most of you I've, I've talked with because I talked to all the, actually all of you I've talked with, I've talked to all the new students, I'm, I'm the advisor uh, for new students coming in, and uh, you'll be assigned a permanent advisor, uh, a member of the full-time faculty, um, in during the first summer session. So that would be mid to late uh, June. Okay. Now, if I could talk and do something else, we would already have this. Okay, PowerPoint. Okay, so you should all have, let's get to the first slide. Well, we know what that is. I'm gonna, we'll, let me go to the um, slideshow. Okay, so folks should have the PowerPoint on your screen. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. So we're gonna start with the uh, faculty introductions. I wanna see if I can get the participants list here to show. Ah, there we go. Okay, we'll start with faculty introductions. Then we then we're going to go to uh, uh, a discuss uh, kind of a, sh a little demonstration of the online resources and our communications protocol uh, or tools. And Michael Cross Fox, uh, the DLIS uh, technical assistant, will uh, handle that part of the presentation. And then I'll have some. Um, some recommendations, and then we'll end with some Q and A. Okay, so um, Dr. Christine Angel uh, will start the faculty introduction. Dr. Angel is the uh, manager of the Archives and Records Management uh, specialization. So, uh, Dr. Angel, would you uh, take over? Sure. Um, I hope everybody is well. As uh, Dr. Borbeck said, I manage the Archives and Records Management Program, and with that, uh, a new class that I'm teaching this semester is uh, data curation. So instead of managing digitized or published resources, you're managing metadata. And so with that said, there's going to be, um, according to the job outlook, there will be many more jobs available in data curation, working at uh, repositories or cover repositories, simply because uh, grant funding organizations such as the NIH, NEH, um, especially at NIH right now, has just made it not only, um, they've made it a requirement starting in 2023 for 
anybody that uploads or wishes to submit for grant funding through the NIH, they actually have to have a data uh, curation, data management policy submitted with that. And so I've already been talking to different um, places, different resources to include uh, St. John's itself with uh, biology and chemistry departments in terms of getting students experience within the management of um, metadata. And so with that and talking about experience, I also teach a lot of academic service learning or incorporate a lot of academic service learning into my classes. So if anybody takes LAS 203 in the fall, you will have as a required part of that uh, class um, academic service learning with the intent of you working in an information environment or with an information environment for six hours during the course of that semester as kind of a double check, uh, is this the type environment of environment that you really want to work in? So uh, maybe you want to be um, a digital librarian, right? But you decide you totally hate that profession, and so you want to switch over to Dr. Sherry Lee and work with youth instead, as an example. I also teach, um, I just taught uh, museum informatics, so um, anything that has to deal with the organization of information as it pertains to libraries, archives, museums, and the web, which data curation is part of, um, that's, that's what I specialize in do. So if anybody has any questions about jobs, job opportunities, um, job possibilities, please feel free to talk to me about that because uh, that's why you're here, right, to get a job. Um, so is there anything else you want me to say, Dr. Vorbach, in terms of an introduction? No, no, that's okay. fine. It's okay. flexible. Very good. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Angel. And now let's move to uh, Dr. Shari Lee, who manages the youth services uh, specialization. Dr. Lee, will you take over? Sure, thanks. Hi, everyone, welcome. Um, most of you um, may not know exactly what you want to specialize in. So um, you may not take a course with me unless you're really interested in youth services, but you will definitely have me for LIS 205, which is a required core course, and it will be one of the first ones you take in a regular semester because these courses aren't often in the summer. So if you started in the fall, you would have prob you would probably have 205 or 204 or both as your first, co first courses. So if you are in my course and you haven't taken 205 yet, you know, nice to meet you. Um, 205 complements 204. It is the reference course. That's probably the easiest way to describe it. Um, sort of goes into how you provide services to clientele in the library, right? How do you find information? How do you, you know, understanding sources, things like that. It's, it's a basic thing that the person behind the reference desk will do, but it involves more things, right? So you will find that there will, there will be a lot of new concepts and the course can feel overwhelming. But if you just do what I ask, you'll be okay. Like, don't panic. Don't, 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 don't get stressed, especially if you're not accustomed to online learning. Everything will unfold in good time. So if you have questions or concerns, you're always free to reach out to me. It doesn't matter what time of the day or night. If I'm available, I will pick up the phone, respond to a text or an email. And one of the things that I like to do for students, because it is an online course, um, an online program, and in online courses, you can feel isolated. I do give you my cell phone number. You can text me, call me at any time. If I'm available, I'll pick up the phone. And I work at night, so if it's two in the morning and you have a burning question, feel free to just you know, shoot me a text. I will respond. So that way you don't feel so isolated and you don't get stuck, you know, wanting to do something and not knowing how to move forward. But the key is to always ask. Don't suffer in silence, all right? I, there are no stupid questions. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have, all right? Not a problem. So my phone number is, get your phones out, 310-703-2561. So if you have questions, let me know. If you happen to be taking my pop culture course, which started today, um, welcome. If you have questions or concerns about the course, just let me know, okay? It, it's, it seems overwhelming because it's a lot of content, but it's all easy reads, fun stuff, fun videos. 
it's not overwhelming at all, right? So don't look at the, the first week and freak out. It's, it's, it's designed to be doable in five weeks and it is the best course you'll ever take for the summer. It's a fun, perfect course for the summer. Because everybody loves social media, everybody loves the internet, everybody loves movies and you know, a TV series and that's what we're gonna be talking about and how that impacts uh, teens and um, society in general. So that's my quick intro for today. Any questions? Oh, we'll save the questions for the at the, yeah, at the okay. end. Yeah, that might be better. Um, but please do uh, put chat questions in the chat box as they come up, because then um, you know you you know you won't forget them. Put them in the chat box, and then we'll go through the chat box at the at the end of the presentation. Uh, for folks who just joined us, we're doing the faculty introductions, and uh, my again. Is, my name is uh, I'm James Vorbach, the director of the program, and the next person I'm seeing I'm not seeing Dr. Rue, Dr. Kevin Rue here. Um, so I'm going to move forward. Uh, Kev, just for information, uh, Dr. Rue uh, dis, uh, advises in public librarianship and also in ac academic librarianship, uh, but I'm not seeing him on the participant li list. Perhaps. He couldn't make the uh, this particular time, so we'll move ahead to Dr. Rajesh Singh, who is manages the uh, the certificate of management program, uh, one of our our first certificate, and we'll be uh, putting together a second certificate, hopefully in place uh, in, in September. But he can, he'll talk to you about that, and he also advises in public librarianship. So, Dr. Rajesh Singh, will you take over? Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Rajesh Singh and I teach a number of courses in the area of management and research uh, method. Dr. So, Rajesh Singh, could you turn? I'm not hearing you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Because A little better. Okay, okay. All right. Okay, so I'm getting close to my mic and hopefully it should be better. I don't know what it, it, it is still difficult for everybody or is it problematic for Dr. Rurbach? He can't hear me. Okay. So Dr. Lee can hear uh, me clearly. Okay. Maybe it's just, uh, okay. Let's go ahead. I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, that's fine. So, so I teach in a number of areas. So primarily I teach courses in the area of management and research method. So regardless of whenever you choose to take one of these courses, um, uh, the required management course LIS 240 or the research method course LIS 239, we will have opportunity to work together uh, in that course. In addition to that, as Dr. Robach said, I teach a lot of uh, uh, elective management courses that are part of our advanced management certificate. And those courses are project management that is offered every fall and, and and marketing and advocacy course that is offered in every spring and the knowledge management course that will be offered here in the second summer session. So these, so those courses are offered in that sequence. In addition, I also teach courses in the area of uh, cultural competence that is being currently offered as it started today. And this summer, uh, I'm also teaching a new course that I have developed about fake news and misinformation. And that course evolved from my ongoing research about information, COVID-19 information experiences. And, uh, and in, 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 in that, it, it was the outcome of that project. And we were able to also uh, develop an advanced certificate in social justice for information professionals. It is still uh, going through the final approval process, and once it has been approved, so uh, you will hear more about uh, those uh, uh, about that certificate. So, as Dr. Robach said, you will be assigned a full a permanent advisor in 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 later, but. If you have any question regarding the advanced management certificate, you can always uh, reach out to me anytime via email or call me or set up a WebEx meeting. 
and and one thing before I wrap up my intro, uh, people have I, I would say about management courses, people have a kind of a often weird perception. It will be boring, or I don't want to be in the management. Regardless of the perception you have about management courses, um, I suggest you consider taking it sooner than later in the program. And those courses are pretty exciting, I have to say. We use a lot of case studies and problem-based scenarios, and once a student take it and they get interested into taking other management courses, it happens all the time. So, so just be open and be flexible to the idea of uh, learning about management, regardless of your specific interest. At this point in time, you will be dealing with people, and this uh, this is something you will need it more than anything else at that time. So, having said this, I welcome you to the program, and if you have any question, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, next. We have Dr. Kristen Sylvian, who holds a joint appointment with DLIS and the history department. And uh, Dr. Sylvian manages the dual degree program, uh, which is a uh, three year uh, full time program where the, the students receive a Master of Science in Library and Information and Science and a Master of Arts in Public History. Dr. Sylvian. Thank you, Dr. Vorbach, and welcome everyone. Um, this is an exciting time for you to start the new program. And of course, the faculty is here um, eager to help you get a good start to the program. Um, we likely um, will not cross paths until perhaps a little bit later in the program, unless you are in the dual degree program, as Dr. Vorbach mentioned, and have your heart set on someday working at the college library, perhaps where you graduated as an undergraduate and dream of uh, being a library faculty member, in which case you'd not only want, of course, your Master of Science in Library and Information Science from our accredited program, but also to get another master's uh, degree, in the case of public history, a Master of Arts in Public History, so that you would go on the job market um, having master's degrees in uh, two different uh, areas of study. So if our paths cross um, as part of your um, electives, um, you might take, for example, my oral history class. And I've made a special effort to um, keep up in oral history with regard to the uh, growing demands that are made on uh, practitioners of oral history with regard to the gathering of metadata, for example, and uh, the demands for uh, preservation of uh, born digital records. Um, another uh, of my elective classes that you might possibly be interested in is the visual culture class in which we look at the history of various types of visual media. Um, in the past, for example, students have focused their research projects on photographic collections, uh, such as the one in the nearby Queens Library, um, which has amassed a large uh, uh, collection of photographs from the World's Fairs in both 1939 and 1964. And of course, um, when uh, those are uh, example of a collection for which there's a lot of interest, um, but little effort or excuse me, little success has yet been uh, progress has been made in the digitization of that uh, uh, large collection. Um, finally, um, to help students with the uh, first of the uh, American Library Association um, learning or uh, professional competency areas um, that um, ask you to have knowledge of the history of the library profession. Um, there is a course called Glam History, Galleries, Libraries, Archives, and Museums. And that's another one of the courses that I teach that is of interest to students in the Library and Information Science program. 
And then finally, our paths might also cross with regard to um, helping arrange internships. As Dr. Angel indicated, she's the primary faculty member um, working in the archival program. But because of the significant overlap between public history and archives, um, I can also assist you in finding an internship at a um, museum library, for example, or a historical society library or um, another such kind of institution or organization that emphasizes more historical types of records. So welcome, and again, if I can be of assistance to you, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sylvian. Next up, we have uh, a member of the faculty in university libraries. Um, Heather Ball is one is one of our uh, uh, part part time faculty members, and and uh, and uh, Professor Ball will be uh, teaching the graphic novels course in the summer. And so I uh, I'd like to um, give Heather Ball an opportunity to let uh, introduce herself to to you all. So uh, Heather, will you take over? You got it. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name, as uh, Dr. Vorbeck said, is Professor Ball. I will be teaching the 273 class graphic novels in libraries this semester. And if you've seen the course description, it's basically going to be a brief history of the medium itself, an introduction to comics theory, and how librarians are using graphic novels, both with outreach or programming, as well as within collection development. Um, it's going to be a little different this year because everything is a little different this year. So we're also going to focus on e or DEI inclusion and how that's represented both within the content of graphic novels and how we can use that as librarians and educators to help start conversations uh, with our users or patrons. Um, as Jim said, I am in the university libraries. I am the uh, digital engagement and student success librarian. So. I know people aren't on campus, but if you happen to find yourself on campus, you can come and say hi. Otherwise, you can always reach out with an email. Um, if you have any questions about our collections themselves or how to use uh, resources for your courses, I can help you with that and just get in contact with me. And I look forward to seeing some of you in my class. Thank you, Professor Wall. Uh, next up, we have uh, Professor April Earl who's been a, another member of our part-time faculty. Uh, April hey. Earl is a member, is a academic librarian at the state uh, college, Farmingdale State College, and is also one of our uh, alumni. Um, so April, we uh, take over from here. Thank you, Jim. Um, my name is April Earl. I teach one summer course for the program. I teach, um, LIS 302, which is genealogical sources and services. I always have to look up the number. I can rem never remember what the course number is, um, but it's 302. Uh, I've been teaching the course for the program, I think for about the last five or six years, um, but I've been doing my own personal genealogy research for about 30 years now. Um, as Dr. Vorbach mentioned, in my full-time position, I'm I'm the head of technical services at uh, Farmingdale State College, which is a college in the SUNY system, the State University of New York. Um, Dr. Singh had mentioned that uh, some people find the management idea boring. I had no interest in managing a department, um, but I am responsible for uh, supervising three librarians, three clerks, and a part-time professional. So I found my management course really something I would go back to frequently, um, have my textbook still on the shelf, actually. Um, so my primary responsibility at the college is cataloging, um, but I also do reference and information literacy instruction, as well as serve as an advisor for the science, technology, and society department on campus. Um, I have a part time job where I work uh, in a public library, working 1 on 1 consulting with patrons who are doing family history research. I also speak publicly on topics uh, related to genealogy research. Most recently on using DNA testing and, and genetic genealogy. Um, 
the course is designed to help students not only learn to conduct research on their own, but to assist others who are doing family history research. Uh, the course has some asynchronous lectures, recorded lectures, some there's reading, a uh, discussion board, a research log. There's some exercises um, to try out some resources, genealogy resources. But a bulk of the course uh, depends on your writing a brief biography on one of your own ancestors. Um, by learning how to do family research on your own, you're better prepared to help people do their research. Uh, it does pose a challenge this class if you are an immigrant or a first generation American, but everybody has ancestors so we can work that out. It's just not every country has lots of records online. So we would have to work together, but you could totally take this class. None of that matters. We can find a way to make it work. Um, we learn in this class that every family is different. Every community and culture maintains records to a varying degree, degree of quality. Um, and not everything's available online. So in a short class that can pose a challenge. Um, this isn't just a course for people who are interested in becoming public librarians, although a lot of genealogy is going on in public libraries. Um, but as an academic librarian, I research in the US Census and vital records all the time. Um, I'm just finishing up a project at Farmingdale now. Uh, we're going to celebrate the centennial of the planting of our World War I Memorial Oak. And for that, I actually tracked down some of the families of our World War I veteran students, and they're coming back to campus, those descendants, not the 100 year old people. Um, but anyway, the course uh, requires a subscription to Ancestry for one month, um, which will run you about 30 to $40, depending on which package you choose. Uh, the library edition of Ancestry is not sufficient for this class. It has, um, the personal edition has features that the library edition does not, and I get lots and lots of questions about how to use a personal account. So just like to warn you that if you're thinking of taking this class, that's going to be kind of your textbook expense. Um, and summer classes are intense and they move pretty quickly. Um, but aside from that, I don't get a lot of negative feedback from my students. Uh, sometimes they say there's a lot of reading, but it's library science, so there's some reading. And uh, that's it. I'll take any questions later if you have them. Thank you, Professor Earl. So next up is uh, me. Uh, I w have been in the uh, Division of Library Information Science since 2004 when I transferred from the math and computer science department at St. John. So my background is a little different. Uh, my background is in computer science. Uh, I have uh, taught, I had been teaching um, some of the technical electives in the 90s. And in 2004, I had the opportunity to uh, change departments and um, I did, and I'm very glad I did. I really enjoy teaching the students in this program, the graduate students in uh, getting their masters in uh, library and information science. And I found out that if you stay here long enough, they make you director. <laughs> but actually, uh, I and I found out becoming director that I really enjoy that aspect as well. The director, of course, uh, it was a little bit more on the administrative side, so I don't see too many students in my the one course I teach uh, each semester. Uh, but on the other hand, I do certainly communicate with the new students uh, coming in, uh, advising the first advisement, and also as uh, if any administrative problems arise, myself and uh, and Michael Crossfox are your contact persons to try to um, resolve those issues with um, you know, the dean's office or whomever may be involved. Uh, so I'm again very, would like 
very happy to welcome you to the program. And I will now move to the next part of our program, which is, well, we'll start with Michael Crossfox introducing himself and then uh, our, the DLIS technical assistant, and he will then move to the section on DLIS resources and communication. So, uh, Michael? Yes, Dr. Vorbach. Uh, take over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll say a little bit about yourself and then, oh, to take over, I have to give you the control. So, let me give you the screen. Okay. All right, uh, as Dr. Vorbeck mentioned, my name is Michael Crossfox. I'm the academic support assistant here in DLIS. I've been at the university for 10 years and I've been at uh, in DLIS for five years. Uh, part of my job here is to make sure that all of you students while you're in the program and even after you're in the program uh, that you're kept up to date with relevant information, both at a program level, but also at the professional level. So, uh, before you would apply for an internship, uh, you would need to find out about internship opportunities and I facilitate that um, with the channels that I'm going to present to you uh, now. So, the 1st channel is the DLIS blog. This receives a lot of information from professional associations around the country uh, and they're posted uh, under certain categories. And you can visit the blog, it's sjudlis.com. And it's a pretty straightforward, uh, this serves two constituencies, current students and prospective students. As current students, you're gonna be using the blog to get information on internships, jobs, and calls for submissions or calls for publication. Uh, a lot of our students uh, submit work, either poster presentations or papers uh, while they're in the program. Uh, there are scholarships and travel funds available if you have a paper accepted at a national conference. Uh, the college does support that and the division also supports that. So uh, you'll look at the blog uh, to find information on those opportunities. Uh, what ends up on the blog starts, I'm uh, sorry, what ends up on the blog is also included in uh, our student digest. So as students starting this summer, You'll get your first issue of this tomorrow. Uh, it goes out every Wednesday. And here's the information that's pretty much organized under these uh, headings. We have announcements, that's news about the division. Uh, webinars, that's a schedule of webinars that will start up again in the fall. And then calls for submissions. These are some opportunities uh, based on, uh, it's organized chronologically by deadline. Other general opportunities such as postgraduate work, uh, fellowships uh, and other activities. Uh, scholarships are also included. You'll get this every week, new scholarship opportunities uh, that fall off as the deadline closes. Again, internships, this is a big part. We do have some exclusive partnerships uh, that allow us to offer um, internships to our students with a preference. So our students would be considered uh, before other students in other LIS programs or other uh, non-LIS programs, depending on the institution. Events, uh, these are events that are happening across the country. Uh, a lot of them are online and a lot of them are free. Uh, so take a look at this. Uh, there's some interesting, uh, this documentary that's happening next week, uh, the free online screening of Change the Subject a documentary about a group of students uh, that requested that the Library of Congress update its subject headings to uh, be more inclusive and to remove the language illegal alien. So uh, that's an interesting documentary. I'm looking forward to that screening next week. These are resources that exist within the university or even outside of the university uh, that we want to bring to your attention, such as this NILA mentoring program. NILA is the New York Library Association. Uh, so they're offering direct mentorship, one-on-one -on -one mentorship with their senior members of library students in New York State. Uh, that's an in-person thing for uh, residents of New York State, but other opportunities will abound. And then finally, jobs. Uh, these are current job offerings. Uh, 
based on the requirements of having an MS LIS or its equivalent. Uh, so some of them are a little strange, but they are current and they'll give you an, uh, the opportunity to see what the job market actually looks like and how jobs are described in LIS uh, so that you can cater your uh, cover letters and resumes to meet those requirements. And finally, the third resource uh, that I want to show to you today is the campus guide, or we call it the lib guide. Uh, this resource acts as a student manual. This has cradle to grave information for managing your program uh, from advisement and registration. As Dr. Vorbach mentioned, as new students, you will be assigned to a full time faculty member advisor this summer uh, because you've already registered for the fall. So you'll be meeting with them in the fall to plan your program for spring 2022 and, and uh, later. Uh, your career development, this tab includes information about career services at the university and other resources uh, from professional associations around the country. The ePortfolio page discusses your end of program assessment and uh, includes uh, recordings of webinars. Uh, the latest webinar happened this past semester, spring 2021. Uh, and we discussed that we have that some with that webinar every semester. So you'll have plenty of opportunities to sit in and learn about the ePortfolio and uh, how to build it as soon as uh, the fall semester. Here's the internship page with all of the paperwork and documentation you need to get uh, your internship done. We do not have an internship requirement in DLS, but you can take up to six credits of internship. Professional associations, this page lists all of the associations and state library associations. Um, so this is a good resource for you to connect and start networking and building a support network uh, for your professional development. This page supports research conducted while you're in the department. So again, if you want to work on a paper for a publication at a peer reviewed journal or a presentation or a panel, these are some resources uh, that the university offers. Uh, the library workshop calendar isn't populated for the summer, but you'll see dates appear there for the fall real soon. Our scholarships page includes uh, perennial scholarships that are offered uh, by the various associations uh, and how to go about applying for a scholarship and then there's the video archive. Uh, it's our policy in DLIS that every synchronous event, such as this orientation session, is recorded and the recording is made available to students who couldn't attend. So this is an archive. We do have a YouTube channel where all of these videos live and the recording of this orientation will be posted to LIS 270, your online orientation course. You'll see that uh, either tonight or early tomorrow. Finally, I'll uh, call attention to Delissa. DeLissa is the Division of Library and Information Science Student Association. It's a student chapter of the American Library Association, uh, which accredits our program, our MSLIS degree. Uh, this fall, we're going to have the general meeting and election. That's generally that's going to take place probably in the second week of classes, so the first half of September 2021. New students are invited to join and to serve as officers. Uh, what will happen is that everybody that started in the summer and starting in the fall, your names will be dropped into a hat and will select new uh, officers and you'll be a junior officer until you achieve 18 credits and the person above you graduates and then you'll rise up into that position. So you would be uh, vice president, president elect, and then once the president graduates, you move up and we fill in a new student uh, behind you. So that's a structure that has worked for us for the last five years and it's really no lifting, little work. Uh, we do produce one event a year, which is the student research symposium that happens in the spring semester. Uh, we didn't get one for 2020 because of COVID, but we're working to make sure that it happens again in 2021. So look forward to that. You'll get more information in the weekly digest going forward. And finally, uh, I'd like to end my spiel with a little bit of housekeeping. So as you know, the summer session has begun today, June 1st, and it goes until July 6th. Summer session two will begin July 8th and proceed through August 11th. And the first day of class for fall 2021 will be September 1st. Uh, so this is me, I'm the academic support assistant. As everyone has said, and I will just reiterate, our policy is to be responsive. So if you have any problems at all, any questions about the program, any questions about associations or networking or anything that is weighing heavily on you, as Dr. Lee said, 
being in an asynchronous online grad program can be isolating, can make you feel like you're in a silo. And so to avoid those feelings, as soon as you start to think that way, reach out to me. Our policy is to get back to students. Some faculty, in-person faculty, your undergraduate faculty might have said something like, I'll reply to an email in 24 to 48 hours. No, that's not how DLIS operates. We provide a solution in 24 to 48 hours. We are constantly in contact or open to contact. So please feel free to email me. My email is on the screen, cruzm at stjohns.edu. Uh, my name has changed, but my email didn't. Uh, so that's me, that's my spiel. And uh, really looking forward to getting to know you over the course of your program. And uh, if at any point I can be of assistance, please simply send the request. Okay, Michael, let me grab back. Okay. Or do you have to release the presentation role? Oh, I, I think I got it. Do you want to change? Okay. Okay, I think I'm back. Now I got to share my screen. Okay, PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, folks, so we should have the outline still on the screen. Okay. Is that is that correct, Michael? Yes. Okay, so let's move forward here. Uh, the next part of our orientation is some recommendations I have for you to think about and to um, kind of organize, put in your like a planner um, at the at the very beginning of the program. And uh, so let's move ahead with that. Okay. I'm not seeing, oh, there we go. Okay, so now we have on the screen planning for your career. Okay, so there's three points here I would like to, uh, to uh, emphasize. One is your program of study. Okay, the courses that will make up the 36 credits and key, very important to that is uh, advisement. In our program, you are advised, students are advised every semester by a member of the full-time faculty. Advisement is prior to registration. So as Michael mentioned, we have a weekly digest that goes out. It is really important that you scan that digest. It's a, it's a way we push information every week, every Wednesday, it comes out and it will have the dates of the advisement in addition to as as michael went over it's got a lot of sections of content but it is very scannable and the uh important dates like for advisement when it begins um that would be at the top and you will you will know your advisor like i said in uh the first summer session uh mid to late june we, you'll get an email with the name of your advisor and then, then you would contact your advisor now advisors may have different ways of setting up appointments and that's fine and but you'll be you'll contact your advisor and you and your advisor will set some set up a a, a, a meeting to discuss your next semester's courses the next time you'll be advised is in roughly the October timeframe. And the registration for the spring term is uh, early November, it would open. Okay, so the, the way the, the process is, is you should, you know, set up your advisement appointment prior to when registration opens, just so you have the opportunity to register 
uh, and you'll be registering online this time. You won't, there won't be this process of going through the Dean's office. That's only something that is necessary for new students. Uh, but as uh, continuing students, uh, your advisor will, will, uh, you'll, your advisor will give you the code you need to register online. And so it's a simpler process. You still have your meeting. You still have a registration form. You still have to sign the registration form along with your advisor. But at that point, uh, your advisor will give you the code to register online. Okay. And I also, you see on the slide here, Degree Works. Degree Works is an application that both you and your advisor have access to. It is a way of organizing your courses uh, in sections related to the requirements. So there'll be a section in in the degree works report, and it's not a lengthy report by any means. It's a you know, one to two pages uh, top, uh, one to two page report. So it'll organize it like the core, the management requirement, the e-portfolio course, which is at the very end, that's that, that's not when you do the e-portfolio, that's simply the last semester. It has some resources, it has some peer review. So you, you, if you have questions, you can share your e-portfolio with other students when you're doing the finishing touches. Things along, it's got a, a number of little advantages to to that course, but, but that's one of the kind of, that is one of the requirements that is broken out in the degree works reports. So instead of like a formal transcript where you just get a list of courses, the degree works has some um, is organized and it's a it's a nice tool and you should definitely uh, print out or or get uh, or save it as a PDF. Get your degree works report prior to your meeting with your advisor. And of course, review the courses that are being offered and they'll be posted to the LibGuide. And in earlier, we post them to that, that um, what Michael mentioned about the tabbed uh, resource. Uh, with, um, that's, that's basically our online student manual. And that's where we post the course offerings and we post them uh, prior to the university posting them on the website. So we give you a little advance notice there. So that's one point is advisement, getting your questions answered, discussing questions on your e-portfolio with your advisor, um, that kind of thing. Uh, if you're, if maybe uh, you may be interested in uh, considering a different uh, specialization or doing a certificate bringing all those questions up when you talk to your advisor every every semester, you'll have that meeting. Okay, my second point, uh, field experience, really, really important. Some of you are already working and that's great. If, if you're working in a position where you want to uh, advance your career, in other words, you're, you're maybe a, 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 uh, uh, a circulation clerk or some, type of position, uh, a library assistant in a public library, and you want to be a librarian. So you're advancing your career by getting the master's degree. Uh, then that that experience is, uh, is perfect. But you may also be in a position where you're changing careers or you're in another kind of job, but you want to move into well, I guess that's changing careers, but you're not, and you're not sure of what area you want to go in. What's the what the, the, this this degree has a wide scope of opportunities. So that's where internships come in. That's where uh, academic service learning, as Dr. Christine Angel mentioned, um, that that is in uh, several courses in our program. It is in the uh, several in the it is in the core, uh, LIS 203. It is in several archival, so several courses in the archival specialization. It is It is also in the web design course. So there's several opportunities. You'll, you'll have an opportunity in the core and also uh, uh, you'll have more opportunities if you, if you do go um, seek the uh, 
archives and records management specialization. Volunteer positions are if if they are giving you the opportunity to um, give uh, be mentored by a uh, professional in the field, they can be useful as well. Um, obviously, if you're working a full time job, you have less less time to do that. But it's just another option out there. Uh, research experiences can give you some insights as to what direction you want to go in. In uh, research experiences are courses. Uh, it's a LIS LIS 901 is the research experience, and several students do that. Um, at following up on, let's say, the research methods core course. And they want to go a little deeper into the uh, into their research project. Maybe maybe carry it, uh, actually complete the research because in in the span of of uh, one semester, two thirty nine, you cannot actually complete the research project. What you're doing as a as a project is you're completing a research proposal. Um, internships, very great. The internships are for credit only. Okay, so they're they're not um, paid positions, but they serve as courses. You can take up to six credits of internships. So they are, you know, three credit courses, uh, usually three credits. They're actually varying credits, but you can uh, most most students do do internships as three credits. But as mentioned, they are not required. They are not required because we do have students that are already in. Um, the the organization of their choice, and they're just they need the master's degree to move up and get that that librarian position. Okay, my last I also um, one last point there. You may we do we do push um, in our uh, job section of the digest full time and part time work. Uh, Part-time work is also a great way to get uh, um, field experience. A lot of positions, you know, students start part-time, and then after doing that, um, it, it be a full-time position opens, and the staff at the organization really like your work, and they offer you the full-time position. So, part-time work cannot be used as an internship, but that. I would never turn down a a, a part-time position if you have the ability to fit it into your schedule. Okay, and then um, I believe this is the last point. Uh, I'll have to check that next slide. Uh, the professional engagement in your state, your state and your I think it's 48 out of the 50 states have arrangements with the ALA for a student rate of like $40, very reasonable. Um, and that, and in many states, you might, it might be accessible for you to go to the state conference. It may not be that far from where you are. Uh, it may be doable. So it is something to consider if you are presenting a poster then you can get travel funds from the college. So um, you, I don't want to, you know, extend the length of this orientation, you know, too long with these kind of, uh, you know, level of details. But I, I certainly uh, take note that there is funding available if you are presenting a like a poster presentation. Uh, or maybe a lightning round presentation. These are these are the kinds of presentations that students often do at professional conferences. They are many of these conferences. Uh, the state conferences have special sessions just for students in library and information science. In addition to travel, if you get a uh, if you get a poster accepted at a professional conference or you participate uh, on a panel, let's say at a press professional conference, or you get a paper accepted, which is probably the highest, uh, um, the most challenging um, of all 
uh, in terms of getting your professional work accepted at a at a at a, at a conference. Um, any of those, you would uh, be you would receive the Wilson uh, H.W. Wilson Professional Development Scholarship, which is not something that goes towards travel, but it's a five hundred dollar scholarship that reduces. It's an award that lowers your tuition by five hundred dollars. So that that is uh, a, another uh, award that is available. So you can get travel money from the college, and you can also get you will get the uh, H.W. Wilson Professional Development Scholarship. And then lastly, uh, lo local professional organizations. Uh, it varies from state to state how how it's organized. Um, you have uh, uh, county uh, library associations in some states. In some states, you'll have regional library associations. Basically, it's just a smaller unit uh, of geography. And in in this context, these are the, probably the the uh, way the best way to network and to attend their meetings and you know meet people and get to know professionals in the field and perhaps participate in committees because the travel distance should hopefully be uh, not too far for you to participate at the local level so again uh, something to think about something to think about uh, something to uh, you know consider while you're going through the program these are all opportunities um, the field experience, professional engagement, and of course, program of study, making sure you are on track and taking the courses that will be most beneficial to you are all ways that you can uh, distinguish yourself when you graduate from the program. So let me just move on from there. Oh, okay. The ePortfolio. Here, I don't I don't want to dwell too long on it here, but the ePortfolio is the end of program assessment. A couple of points. You will get an account in the plat in the platform we use called Digication. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. Uh, they'll summer students will get it in the summer or the fall? In, in the fall. Okay. So as you heard from Michael, in the fall, you're gonna get the account along with the students starting in the fall. And once you have the account, one of the first things you wanna do is log in, maybe do a tutorial. The learning curve is not very steep. This is a software platform designed for e-portfolios. It's not a general purpose website type of program. So looking at one or two of the tutorials, which are posted on our uh, the DLIS LibGuide that uh, Michael showed you on the e-portfolio tab, um, should give you some confidence on the technology. And then you could start uploading artifacts from your courses just to have them saved in the Digication platform. So when you get, and, and, and perhaps also put down some notes, some notes after you take the course. Um, you wouldn't want to try to write the write the reflections at that time because it's important to reflect back on your program of study um, when you are uh, approaching the end of, of the program. But what really helps is when you're not looking for things, you're not looking for artifacts, you're not looking for, oh gee, where's the notes when I took this course? Use the Use the tool to store your artifacts as you proceed through the program. Use the tool to uh, store notes as you proceed through the program. So it, it so the information is contained in one place. Um, and occasionally practice the tool um, when you get a chance. You know, practice. It's like I said, it's a tool that is designed for the purpose of ePortfolio. Uh, building e-portfolios and uh, the learning curve is really not that steep at all. Uh, one nice uh, feature is that your account, um, you keep your account as alumni. So then you can use the 
uh, e-portfolio, and you can make additional e-portfolios in the same account to help you get jobs. You could put a link, you could have an e-portfolio which has maybe a few artifacts uh, that are just focused for a particular job you're applying for and have a link to that e-portfolio in your resume. Again, these are all ways that you can um, you know, distinguish yourself when you get uh, when you are when you graduate. Um, it, related to this is that every semester. We have an e-portfolio workshop. It's a webinar. The most recent one is already is posted, and so you can actually look at it now. The one that was in the spring. Uh, the most recent one is on the e-portfolio tab of the LibGuide, and uh, there's some little changes every semester. So it's good to, uh, uh, if you can't attend the the meeting synchronously, it's a it's good to watch the recording once it gets. Uh, once it gets posted a couple of days after the uh, after the uh, um, workshop, okay. And and that about that wraps it up um, for my recommendation section. This last slide here is simply uh, career links um, on ALA's website. ALA provides career links for not just the traditional librarianship jobs. It also provides career link, a career link for non-traditional jobs, which again, until you browse them, you may not be even aware that they exist. It may be something that you really are interested in. So that's why this slide is here, is to get, so you have this, uh, this link that you could uh, you know, browse, this web page on ALA at your um, at your uh, at your t the time that you have available to you. Okay, at that point, I will stop and we'll move to the chat box. Let's get to that. Okay. I can stop sharing. And let's take a look at the chat box here. Let's go to the top. Okay. I see, I'm just reading this. Okay, drop questions in. When we're hiring at Farmingdale State College. Oh, I'm just reading, you, you can read this as well as me from uh, Professor Earl about um that a little a little plug for the e-portfolios i've had the same kind of experience at conferences when employers do like that 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 ability to see your work and it's and again so you're in control of it it's your account you can you decide whether it's public or private and when it's public, you can take the link and put it in your resume. And uh, those that you share that resume with have access to that particular portfolio. And so that's a really nice uh, 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 a really nice option. No, not an option. It's a really nice feature that you keep your accounts after you graduate. So, um, Okay, let me move on, move on from there. And Matt Myers said, uh, can we have those links in the chat, please? Uh, sure, that's a good idea. Let me go to, actually, I gotta, I gotta, uh, let's go to that PowerPoint. Give me a, about a minute. There it is. Okay, let's go back to the meeting. It didn't, it didn't take. 
try again. Wait a sec. Oh, it did. Okay. There it is. Okay. Any other questions, folks? I think that's pretty much. Oh, and then Michael posted the uh, the link to the uh, uh, libguide, our manual. Um, you could also get to the libguide because I always forget this URL from the blog. The blog is a very easy URL to remember. Uh, S-J-U-D-L-I-S dot com. And just go to resources, and from there you can get uh, to the libguide as well. But we have the URL right here for the libguide. And uh, that may be it. Anyone else? Any questions? Or we'll just we'll wrap up the summer 2021 orientation. Okay, folks. It's been a pleasure. Again, I welcome you to the program and I look forward to, uh, you know, further meeting you or e communicating to, with you via email, any issues you may have, uh, and have a great summer term. Take care. Bye-bye.